to live content with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury and refinement rather than fashion, to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to study hard, think quietly, talk gently, act frankly, to listen to stars and birds, to babes and sages with open heart, to bear all cheerfully, do all bravely, await occasions, hurry never, to let the spiritual, unbidden and unconscious grow up through the everyday existence. This is to be our symphony. Those words from William Henry Channing, a 19th century Unitarian, they welcome you all to this morning's Sunday gathering here with Kensington Unitarians at Essex Church, both here in London and those of you joining us online from around the world. It's good to have you with us. If we've not met before, I'm Sarah Tinker, and as a retired minister, I have the luxury of visiting different con congregations around the country and even abroad. For ours is a while worldwide movement, a beacon, if you like, for all those who seek a spiritual community, a community that will encourage, encourage finding our own path in life, in good company with others. So here, nobody will tell us what to think, but the invitation is to go a little deeper, to consider a wider picture, and to support one another when the going gets tough. Our chalice flame is lit, it's shining that beacon of welcome and reminding us we are part of something greater than our small selves. One people living one life on this, our only planet home. So, our first hymn today can be found in the Purple Hymn Book. It's number 142, and the words will appear on screen for folks online. It's called Shining Through the Universe, and the words are written by Roger Mason, a member of our Golders Green congregation. Roger has had a fascinating life. He spent many years as a geologist in China, and his words in this hymn describe a Taoist concept of there being a thread of gold for each of us to follow in life, a thread that connects all life. Now, as the tune may not be familiar, Peter, I'm thinking, should we hear it all the way through? Uh, and then we'll start to sing. Oh, have we done it lots? All right, ignore me on that one. We'll just, yes. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> all right, thank you.
So let's join in a time of reflection and prayer now. For which of us has not at some point in our lives experienced a, a certain apathy or listlessness, a sense of soul loss even, a feeling that joy has deserted us and that effort is pointless. How human it is to experience such a lowering of the spirits. You might think of it as the sun being hidden from us behind a cloud and all is gray and dull. So may the spirit of life and love be with us now and with all who struggle in life this day. And we know that for some people, this is a gloomy world that rarely brightens. For some, the weight of poverty, illness, aloneness are too much to bear. So let us think for a moment with love and compassion of those who must live with such burdens and pray that such burdens can be if lifted and eased. We live in times when some of us will find our spirits lowered by our concerns for this world and all its inhabitants. May we have love and compassion for ourselves in those times. And we may also be aware that the world itself, the world community goes through times when it feels as though its very soul has become lost and confused, taken over, swept away by tyranny and strife. And yet again and again, in the history of the world, love and good sense have prevailed once more and the struggles of individuals and groups have indeed secured freedom and justice. Here in London this morning, the sun is shining a little outside. May this light shine throughout our world and bring a message of hope and love once more to all beings. May all spirits be lifted, may all souls feel brightened and lightened by the comfort offered by those around them. And also by a sense of comfort that can be found within. May these be accessible for all, these days and all days. Amen. We've got a, a poem now. Um, if, if anybody wants any of the readings from today, um, just email me. But in fact, you can always find the whole script of our services online um, if you'd like to actually read something. So it's hard to take it in just first time of listening, isn't it? I don't know if you'll have heard of Parker J. Palmer. Um, he's a really well-regarded educator, writer, social activist. He founded what's known as the Center for Courage and Renewal in the States, and he's a member of the Society of Friends. This poem is called Everything Falls Away, and it begins with a quote from William Stafford, who writes that there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. So Parker Jake Palmer writes, sooner or later, everything falls away. You, 
the work you've done, your successes, large and small, your failures too. Those moments when you were light, alongside the times when you became one with the night. The friends, the people you loved, who loved you, those who might have wished you ill, none of this is forever. All of it is soon to go, or going, or long gone. Everything falls away, except the thread you followed, unknowing all along. The thread that strings together all you've been and done. The thread you didn't know you were tracking until toward the end. You see that the thread is what stays as everything else falls away. Follow that thread as far as you can. And you'll find that it does not end, but weaves into the unimaginable vastness of life. Your life never was the solo turn it seemed to be. It was always part of the great weave of nature and humanity, an immensity we come to know only as we follow our own small threads to the place where they merge with the boundless whole. Each of our threads runs its course and then joins in life together. This magnificent tapestry, this masterpiece in which we live, forever. So thank you to Parker J. Palmer for that one. We're moving into a time of meditation now. And um, it starts with um, the quotation from Michael Mead, which is also on your order of service. This is from the author, the mythologist and storyteller, Michael Mead, who writes that this world is essentially a place of mystery, and what looks darkest at the beginning can have bright threads hidden within. So the invitation as we move into a meditative time is for us to consider some of the bright threads that have emerged for you in life when things were tough. So I'll say a few words to guide us into silence. And then that time will end with a chime from our bell and be followed by music from Abby and Peter. So let's do what we need to do to be as comfortable as we can be for the next few minutes. Maybe taking one of those breaths that help us relax and deepen. Giving us a sense of softening our bodies, especially our eyes and our facial muscles particularly that forehead that can hold so much tension. Let's just soften for a moment. Let's be aware of our feet resting on the floor, connecting us with Mother Earth. Maybe give your shoulders a bit of a stretch up towards our ears and then letting the shoulders drop downwards and backwards. As our backs slowly lengthen and our sternums and chests gain a sense of opening to what is, a sense of being willing to face life and to hold always the comforting awareness that life and this world is essentially a place of mystery and what looks darkest at the beginning can have bright threads hidden within. So we enter the fellowship of silence together. Let's remember some of the bright threads that we have found in the course of our lives.
This reading is from an essay entitled World Worry by Pierre Elias Amidon. A disturbing litany of disasters confronts us in most woke writings these days, and for good reason. Our planet and human civilization are encountering, encountering conditions in which the Earth's capacity for nourishing life is endangered at a magnitude unknown in human history. You know the litany, songbirds vanishing, soil depleted, poisons in the air and in our bodies, countless trillions of plastic fragments floating in all the oceans, a fierce ambition in human economies to grow past all limits, populations of refugees fleeing from social and climate disruption and ever increasing injustice, distrust, polarization, and domination of the many by the few. All of this is stirring in us world worry, a sense of foreboding that is draining the vibrancy of human culture, as well as our physical, psychological, and spiritual health. We see a menacing cloud over the future and feel helpless to do anything about it. World worry is not something we can avoid. Even if we try to shut it out and just devote ourselves to the demands and pleasures of our personal lives, the storm gathering over us and over our children and their children is a portent we can't ignore for long. While we may realize that world worry is sapping the energy from our lives, at the same time we feel if we don't worry, about what's coming down, we'll take no action to forestall it. Realize, realizing our world worry would mean giving in, giving up. How can we be with this? What is our responsibility in this fateful time? What is asked of us? And then there's this troubling question. Can we be awake to the enormous ecological and social disruption that's happening now and that's ever increasing? Disruption that, I repeat, is on a scale that no generation before us has had to face. Can we be awake to it and still live happy, beautiful, and fulfilled lives? There are no easy answer to, answers to these questions and no easy fixes. As the days and years pass, each of us will have to contend with this intractable challenge in a matter, manner suited to our own lives. These are a few thoughts of my own in response to these questions, culled down to some basic principles, offered not as definitive answers, but more as a starting point for your own contemplation and questioning. And now, luckily and hopefully, Sarah is going to come up and give us some ways to ease those worries and the sense of world worry, weariness. Oops, two kids. Thank you very much, Julia, for taking that difficult reading because it's hard to face the troubles of our world, isn't it? Hard indeed. And um, and I wish you could all meet um, Pierre Elias Amidon, who is the spiritual director of the Open Path Sufi Way, a longtime friend of uh, Michaela's. So have a chat with her about Elias. And uh, so it's his essay that we've uh, just heard an extract from. And he's an extremely cheery man. He came and spent an afternoon with us here at Essex Church some years ago now, and his gentle and deep listening and teaching, I think it really touched us all. So in the essay, he goes on to offer all of us who worry about the state of our world, three steps that we can take to counterbalance our gloom and anxiety. And these are, to keep an undefended heart, to find what matters and to do the beautiful. And I'm going to explore these in a little 
more depth in this address. But before that, I want to mention another teacher who really speaks to my needs at present. I've used several quotes already from Michael Mead in today's service, and uh, I'd like to thank him for his generosity of the, all the material that he makes freely available online through his Mosaic Voices website. Michael tells stories and delves into mythology to help shine a light on the struggles of today. And I have him to thank for telling me about an ancient papyrus. I wish you could have him tell this story because when I heard it online, you can listen to it. Um, it I just was enchanted, really. So this is the story of a, a piece of papyrus thought to be over 4,500 years old. And it's only a fragment. But on it is found what's considered to be one of the oldest pieces of personal writing. Both the beginning and the end of this writing are lost. But what remains is still remarkable. It's the voice of a very unhappy Egyptian who despairs of the society in which he lives. It's become known as the lament of the world weary man. And although his voice comes from thousands of years ago, in many ways, it could be contemporary to our concerns. The society is fragmented, the ruthless prosper. The unknown writer is in despair. He no longer wants to live. He questions whether living has any meaning and whether life has genuine purpose in a world gone wrong. And as this world weary man from thousands of years ago reaches what might seem to be the end of his ability to cope, he turns inward and calls upon his soul and the soul answers him. And the soul's answer? Well, in modern language, it could almost be telling him to get a grip, stop complaining, be grateful for life itself. I'm quoting now, uh, make offerings on the altar of life. And most importantly, the soul goes on to explain that Death will come for both the human individual and for the soul when they will follow together the thread to lands unknown. Michael Mead writes further that the heart of the human drama concerns whether we are becoming greater vessels for the flow of life. Spirit calls us to a higher sense of self, while soul would connect us more deeply to the heart of nature and the soul of the world. When in touch with soul's inner thread, we can find the arts and the practices that allow our spirits to awaken and our hearts to open, to be fully alive, making more soul and incarnating spirit is the only thing that satisfies the longings seeded in our hearts in a garden. Words from Michael Mead. So two spiritual teachers were reminding me this week to keep an undefended heart, an open heart. I wonder what that imagery evokes for you. I suspect it's different for all of us. What, do you sense when your own heart closes down defensively? I feel it when I'm anything less than loving in response to individuals and situations. And I sense it when I'm overwhelmed by the news I'm hearing. Elias Amidon makes the wise suggestion that our very worry for the world may itself be a kind of defense when we anticipate the awfulness and close down to protect ourselves. He suggests that instead we stay open hearted to the difficulties other human beings face and we feel their suffering, acknowledging our own powerlessness and all the anxiety that provokes in these minds of ours that just yearn, don't they, to be in charge of this frighteningly chaotic world in which we live our days. 
Elias's second suggestion for those of us who are world weary and filled with anxiety is to find what matters, what truly matters. He describes this as a process that be can become second nature to us. And I suspect some of you know this already. For if we live with undefended hearts, will we start to understand the essential truth that we're not separate from this world? We're an integral part of all that is. And from that perspective, well, at every moment of choice or uncertainty, we can ask ourselves, well, what is right now? What matters here? This is the following of the golden thread that from the Taoist tradition that we sang about in our first hymn this morning. And the ancient Egyptian papyrus text would remind us to consult our soul, whatever that means to us, before we make choices in life. Will this path be for the highest good of all concerned? And then Elias's third suggestion is to do the beautiful. This is a Sufi principle and describes actions that fit the circumstances that we find ourselves in. These are actions that arise spontaneously and feel right in the situation at that time. Again, I think we all know, don't we, those moments when what we need to do just comes to us. Rumi, the Sufi poet, reminds us, let the beauty you love be what you do. We are called to create beauty in the living of our lives, finding and doing what is beautiful, that which feels right for us and for the whole caboodle. Now, not all of us are world weary. Thank goodness. <laughs> I know many people who are living fulfilled and creative lives who are happy at peace but for those who do despair of the state of our world and of our own society let's take this advice to to work on the restoration of our own souls to work on deepening our connection with our soul our own sense inner sense of something greater than ourselves whatever name we give to that that we might find this hidden thread in life that can help us regain our sense of meaning and purpose. Whatever storms rage about us, whether that sun is shining down on us or is hidden behind the clouds, together then, together, we can explore the beauty and the mystery of our precious world and our remarkable and completely unique lives. May that be so. Amen. Well, one of the sources of soul restoration for me, and I know for many of you, is listening to music. And a few weeks ago, it would have been Nina Simone's 90th birthday. And I've been really enjoying listening to various Radio 3 programs about her life and music. And I heard a particularly soulful rendition of the old gospel song, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel To Be Free. And then I remembered it. Look, we've got that in our hymn books. So I'm, I'm not expecting us all to sound like Nina Simone, but if you can bring your own inner Nina Simone out in singing this hymn, I'll be chuffed. But as we sing, let's remember a black woman who was stopped from studying at the top classical level of music education, which she was more than able to achieve. She went on to have a challenging but hugely accomplished career as a singer and pianist, and she improved life in our world, I reckon, both through her music, but particularly through her social activism because she had an international standing and her voice mattered, especially for the civil rights movement. So I wish I knew how in honor of Nina Simone.
Well, as always, um, we've got announcements on the back of the order of service sheet, and these get sent out in the Friday email. So do check what's going on. Um, I like to start with thanks, as always, to our tech team of I think it's Janine with you online today, Ramona here in church, our musicians, Abby and Peter, marvelous stuff, and to Jane, who does so much behind the work, behind the scenes work, even when it's on a Sunday off. Um, I wanted to make a special mention that this week and uh, marks three years of hosting Heart and Soul online. And if you've not experienced that before, if you just haven't booked in yet, there are some spaces for this evening or next Friday or Sunday evenings. It's a lovely, intimate, spiritual space. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that the London Green Spirit Group will be here in person next Monday to celebrate the Spring Equinox Gathering, and there's going to be a lunch and then a workshop here in the afternoon. Everybody's welcome, and there'll be some mention of composting and its great value in this world. Any other mentions? Oh, the coffee morning on Wednesday morning. Sonia, your NIA classes are online on Wednesday, I do believe, and Friday here in person. Excellent. And then next week, um, we've got lots of people leading the service. There's Jane Blackall, David Brewerton, Roy Clark, and Anne Howell having a look at faith in action. Smashing. Do stay for tea and coffee after the service, both online or here in the church. It's good to have a chat afterwards. And first of all, a closing blessing on us all. May the courage of the early morning's dawning and the strength of the eternal hills and the peace of the evening's ending and the love of all that is great and good be in our hearts and accompany us all in the week ahead. Amen. Go well, all of you, and blessed be.